Good afternoon. So this is the first video I've done in a long time. So we're going to whack through it really, really quickly. Um, there's been lots of changes that I've done over time, lots of little changes, but I just want to do a quick post now and uh, describe them all to you. So I'm going to split this into three parts. I'm going to give you a quick whistle stop update of what I've done. I'm going to talk about other things I've done around new features in the database and then talk about uh, and review some of the code. So very quickly on the theory, first of all, there's lots of changes that I've done recently. So I'm working on Milestone 1, which is the V0.1 release, if you like. Um, so last time we talked, we were kind of down here. We were just uh, we just done the storage layer of abstractions and we were talking about the theory behind buckets and behind indexes and term listing and trying to make things an order of magnitude simpler. So that's what I've done. So I've finished implementing buckets. Um, I've also added sets as well as buckets. Um, so rather than store a simple string value and retrieve a simple string value, you can store a set of values. The reason I needed that is because if you think about building an index, all an index is, is a list of keys. But rather than store values, you're storing pointers to other records. So if you're needing to store a list of what uh, buckets each record is in, Rather than store that as part of the record and then have to search through it, you store an index um, with the name for that bucket, and then you store a pointer to all the records. So that's a simple uh, reverse index like a term list, basically. And we'll be using term lists a lot for the basis of search functionality in the future. So I've implemented that. So we've now got a file key value store, uh, or an in-memory key value store, so a key value store, and uh, you've got a separate index store. So one for the data that the database user can request and one that's kind of internal for indexes so anything indexy that's configured in the database that will be where that's stored so it's stored alongside the data so it's still within the same folder but it's within a protected area with a different key space so there's no clashes or collisions and that's definitely what you want to do so the number of records is not affected by the number of indexes totally independent um, so that's great so we've implemented that now what I've also had to do because of that is implement um, not just support for strings but supports for keys and keys of different types so keys of strings keys of ints keys of anything you want really and um, the same with values so values could be a single binary value it could be a blob an image if you wanted it could be anything so what i've done is i've implemented lots of templating and um, to enable you to pretty much put anything in there and i've tested all the standard kind of intrinsic types in c plus plus strings i've uh, vectors of bytes because that's under the hood what they're stored as um, also the hashing of all those things automatically and transparently to the user and so that it doesn't impact performance by hashing multiple times. So all that's done. <laughs> so there's an awful lot in there. And um, there's some things that don't quite work. So custom types, being able to store them and retrieve them is not quite working yet. You'll have to convert them to like a byte array or something yourself or one of the basic types and then you can store it. Well, then that works great. Um, what I've also done is I've got taken some uh, feedback. So uh, there's been some people that have been uh, asking um, for things like um, it being able to compile on Linux. So that is all now uh, implemented. So um, Phil Ashby there, who's <laughs> someone I've known for a while, but is uh, recently retired. He's been <laughs> uh, doing some work on that. So I've merged that in today after testing it myself. I've now got it working on C making Visual Studio across Linux, across Windows, and across my Mac, obviously, and that's all working great. Um, so now you can pretty much download this on any platform, run a couple of commands and you're up and running. So it's pretty, pretty cool. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Um, I've also done a lot more wide ranging performance tests, obviously, because there's a lot of stuff here that could quite easily break if you don't put lots of tests in. So there's now hundreds and hundreds of cases. So if I uh, quickly run through the test cases here, you'll see they run very, very quickly. 325 assertions now. There was about 20 before, I think. And then similarly, uh, there's query performance as well as um, normal gets and sets as well. So by implementing bucketing and by saying, I want to store this record, but I want it in this named bucket, what you can now do is you can say, well, actually, just give me uh, just give me the records or the keys for the records of everything that's in that bucket. So this is what I've now implemented as well. So here you'll see, for example, that uh, if I have a million keys in my in-memory key value store, i zoom in a bit there, um, so if I have a million keys in my memory key value store, um, set those keys, and then we can, if we know the keys already, which you wouldn't, right? Um, you wouldn't know the keys in a bucket, and I retrieve all of those. It takes this long. Whereas if I'm doing a query and returning the records, 
Um, it takes two thirds of the time. And bear in mind, this is for known <laughs> buckets. So this is repeatedly get, 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 get. You're not doing that. You're doing one query and we're achieving it all. So we're saving a third of time on that. But well, this is a very unusual circumstance. You wouldn't normally know the keys of the stuff that was in the bucket. You need a way of saying, give me all the keys. And we've not implemented that. So this is, so it's even, it would be even slower. So that's why querying is really, really good. And this is the first example of the querying we've got in there. Um, so we've got lots uh, to go through, really. Um, so that's mainly what we've been doing. Um, what I've also been doing is this as well. I've treated myself. I bought myself an early Christmas present. This is a program that I really like called Git Kraken. It's commercial, but if you're doing open source development, it's free. I bought the paid for version because I really like it and I've been using it for free for years in open source projects and I was like, sod it, I'm going to buy it. So I've treated myself to this. I'll now use this across all platforms. Um, don't really need it. I know the command line of Git pretty well. But we've gone through, uh, I was just getting fed up of um, not having good visibility on fast forwarding and pulling in PRs and stuff. So I've now put it in here. Um, what you can also, what I've also done is I've renamed the uh, master and developed branches. The master is now trunk, like a tree. So the main part of the tree. The stem, which is where all the new growth comes from, right? You get it? The stem comes off of that and um, all the new. Um, feature branches come off of the stem, so that's where all the new growth comes in. You see, so that's that. Hence the name trunk and stem. I don't think that'll catch on. It's just a weirdness that I particularly like, so I'm sticking to it. Um, also, something else that's come out recently. You might have seen that the GitHub have released a command line interface. Um, so as well as the Git command, you can do gh GitHub. I've used that for the first time today. Um, Phil's patch um, is pull request. I was like, you know what? I need to test this out. So I did gh. Um, PR um, check out and checked out his PR tested it modified it pushed it up with the standard git command into my feature branch and it kept all of his work history because he's been parallel you know trying to get it working whilst I've been working on the features and now I've managed to merge them in so it's kept his commits in there uh, in history as you can see here so you've got all his changes and it's also kept mine in there as well so it yeah it's great it's worked really really well that command line I've also got the git flow on the command line as well so i can do git flow uh, feature start and then a feature number and it'll do all my naming for me for feature branches and i can finish features push them in uh, it's really really good so yeah definitely recommend i think they've done a really good job on that yeah uh, github uh, command line interface so even though it's version one it's still pretty good that's good news um in addition to that um We've had somebody else, uh, I think Michael Howard, I think his name was, uh, I will check, my memory's terrible, sorry. Um, he was doing similar to Phil, but on Windows, making sure that works. Now, it just so happens I've got my Boudicca machine here, which is an absolute beast. Uh, it's um, Intel chip from the start of this year. 14 physical cores, so 28 um, hardware threads. It's an absolute beast. So I've been making sure it runs on there efficiently. So I now can run Visual Studio Code. On any platform, you use CMake on any platform. So on a Mac, it compiles successfully with CLang. On Linux, it compiles successfully with GCC with the um, C17 file system um, add on, which is now part of CMake, so you don't have to worry about it. Uh, and it also compiles on Windows in MSVC. So all of those compilers work, um, and all the tests pass, and all the performance tests look good across all those platforms. So that's really, really good news. So thanks for, you know, uh, Phil and Michael for. You know, doing some work on that and suggesting uh, some changes that's actually really helped me out um what else have i done yeah so that's the whistle stop saw the changes what we'll do now is we'll step into uh, the code so we've done all these things here that we've mentioned um but let's go have a look at the code i'm now in visual studio code i've stopped using cute develop not because i don't like it um but because i wanted to use something consistent across platforms and wanted to make sure that whatever i was doing was consistent in CMake. So what I'll probably do is I'll deprecate um, the Qt develop stuff and rip that out uh, soon because I'm using more and more command line tools and integrating them into my build flow. Um, I want to may integrate automatic testing of branches and commits. I want to also integrate uh, automatic testing to make sure that I don't have any performance reversions. So I'm going to make sure that my tests include like Valgrind steps. Um, and other steps to test performance on different platforms, automate the hell out of that so that, you know, before anything hits trunk, we know absolutely what its performance effects are going to be across all platforms. I don't want one change somewhere hosing 
the code elsewhere and that's what's been happening recently so i'm going to use my big beast of a machine and go away for vmware so i've got vmware workstation installed on there for free um because i work there and i'm just gonna use that as well as um pivotal concourse which is a part of vmware again i'm gonna use that to automate all the build which is really good um so that's what i'm gonna do uh what i've done recently though i'll go through the changes so the readme has changed i'll mention this briefly is because we've now using sub modules instead of manually go and fetch this library it's now a sub module when it needs to be if it's header only and it's apache 2 license i keep it within my repository and do a, a pull of that but if it's something external like google's highway hash um where i want to build only linking rather than a source code linking um i do the git sub module so that's pulled in now uh, more cmake commands now so if you're doing that this actually works across all platforms i did test it today um so we've got the cute creator in there if you want to use it um i've also got command line examples command line doesn't really work with sets or anything it's a simple command line so i'm gonna have to figure something out there uh, the tests are all here there's also performance tests i've made it so the performance tests don't always run because that was just taking forever so that's now a separate thing i'll put that as part of the build process so people don't have to do that as part of the prs um and there's more feature sets there but basically this is much simpler and it works across platform i've also included high level latest performance results so the these performance results are pretty amazing so if you look at the in-memory store which is the kind of primary comparison i don't want to mess around with discs and stuff so the sets have slowed down this was about 4 million whereas this was about 4.3 so or 4.6 so it was always a little bit slow, as you'd expect, but that's slowed down a lot. And that's because of the highway hash implementation and because of a few things I'm doing around um, converting up front. So when you set a value, I convert up front and then set it. So this is to be expected. You know, the more ingest level work you do, the slower this will go. But bear in mind, this is on a single hardware thread. So if you're on like a 14 core machine like my big box here, um, it's using half of those cores, half a half of one of those cores, the one twenty eighth of the power of my machine, because we've not sharded these keys yet. Um, so we will do that soon. But the performance here is still pretty amazing. Now this is operations per second. So this is one point six million keys I can set per second, and four point three I can retrieve per second. Simple short keys. Um, what I've also done is because we've implemented querying now, because we've got hashes of each key as well as a hash of each value. I've implemented querying. So instead of saying go pull back all the keys and figure out which bucket they're in or list me all the keys, what I can do now is I can have a query, simple at the moment, just one query implementation, which is what bucket is it in. But as you can see already, you know, it's it's saving a third off the time of retrieval, so it's well worth it. Um, the file store has drastically reduced in performance. That's like one twelfth, one fifteenth of where it was. Um, that's something I need to work on. So this file store is really slow. This is actually has improved this morning through a few fixes I've done in the templating area. Um, I need to do a bit more. There's lots of times hashed values are being created from hashed values and that's wasting a bit of performance there. Uh, although I've improved it quite a bit. So that's looking pretty good. If we then leave this file and go and have a look at some of the code now, which I know you're all dying for me to show up and talk about the actual code. What I've done now is I've added a few new things in here. So we've now got a generic hashes. It was getting to the point where I had to refer to hashing everywhere. So I've now got a generic hash interface, really. So this is kind of a default hash. So this is the functionality of hashing that GroundUpDB needs support for because of how it's built. But it doesn't specify the way hash is implemented in the library so that you know there's an indirection there so you don't get stuck. Um, with one hash type and then after recompile everything that hashes function that default hash is referred to elsewhere uh, within ground up db within types i've got now got because i support for any key i uh, basically what i do is when it hits the database if it's i'm supporting any type from the app but at the moment on the back end in the store it's still quite dumb as to what it's doing with those values so you can either give it um, a value, which is effectively a binary value, gets converted to a set of bit bytes, which is basically this. You know, it's a standard vector of standard byte, and I convert everything to that efficiently. There's lots of work I've done on that, which I've boy with. Looked at memory traces a lot, but I'm now getting up to something like 89% um, of the time that my database is spending when you're setting a key is purely on memory work. 
so it's it's pretty damn efficient um which is really good news so i'm using that everything gets converted to that so i either support something that can be converted to that or i support um a list of things and that could be a list of any type as well so um but really you know if you provide a vector to set key even if you provide a set to set key it won't interpret it as a set as far as my database is concerned and that's to give you as a developer the option that if you say well i don't want the database to do anything clever with this value because i know i'm just going to store and retrieve it i don't want it to index that'll give me a performance hit so all i do in that instance is you just store that a value with that key no bucket specified and then there's no indexing done it's just stored as quickly as possible and retrieved as quickly as possible so that that's supported in future you know we've added support for sets and basic types but in the future we'll add maps and things like that for more performance but at the moment we don't do that that's what we've got so we've got this key class so this is templated so i've had to have read like 2000 page documentation i've used templates before but only simple ones and i've had to get quite technical uh, across a lot of this so i've, I've read over 2000 pages of reference material like on modern c++ just to make sure i got my head around it still don't think i've quite got my head around it but that's that's meta programming for you um but yeah so we've implemented this very thin wrapper and all this does is store a set of bytes so so long as the thing that you pass in um can be converted to a set of bytes transform and then days um that does mean though that effectively anything, everything has to be a hashed value or an encoded value. So we've got this concept of an encoded value. Um, this is whether you can convert between things easily. I'll oh, worry about that later. So we've got the concept of hashed values. All this is, is again a set of bytes. So this comes from the key. So you specify, here's my key, set of bytes, or something convertible to that. Um, and then it stores whether it has a value or not, its length and the actual hash. Uh, as well and this is again heavily templated and by heavily i mean heavily so i mean look at this one this is an absolute beast this isn't necessarily the best way of doing it. i'm going to split this out but this effectively accepts any type um so long as it's one of these so if it's a string simple string um or uh, if it's a, a kind of char and that's required because a lot of time if you put if you put a key within quotes then it'll actually be a char array rather than a string um so that's in there um also const as well that was giving me different answers which was a bit annoying um also if it's a type of numeric numeric so if it's an integer um we can handle it if it's floating point it we can handle it um if it can be if it is already a set of bytes we can handle it that's something that i forgot originally um and if it's a container so this is all stl containers but not just stl containers Anything, any custom code you've got that is STL container-like interface um, and that can be converted to a set of bytes and we pull that in as well. So we support custom STL, custom types as well, including keyed, so this is maps. This is where rather than just an iterator over a set of values, it's an iterator with a pair of a key and a value. I support all that as well. Um, not figured out yet how to do a custom class with a... Um, you know an explicit or implicit conversion operator but i'm working on that at the moment that's pretty cool so that's hashed values here's the concept of a key that's already been hashed is really hashed value i've just called it hashed key and the reason for that distinction is so that when you're reading through the documentation like set key value store it doesn't say hashed value hashed value that just confuses the crap out of everyone i'll put hash key and uh, encoded value bc makes complete sense when you're reading the documentation simple alias works quite well um, what I've done is start having a high level concept of type. This is definitely going to change. So these are internal types. So really, instead of C++, that should be custom more than anything, or uh, or some other you know, type that the driver, whether it's a C++ driver or whatever, can convert back. Um, so I need to figure out how to do that in a platform and program language independent way, but without restricting people too much. So at the moment, I've just got keys, that's an unknown, that's the only types I support. So, uh, and CPP, which is basically in it default. Which is weird. Uh, I've also got stream operators defined for these types, for that type. Um, and then there's encoded values. This is something that's either passed in as a value or retrieved when you do get key value, um, rather than get key value set. If you do get key value set, it gets pulled out as a set, but you've got to use our internal set idea. Um, 
So encoded value is what you get back. Again, there's lots of templating going on here, lots of commented out stuff which I need to tidy up. But effectively, most stuff is kind of convertible if it's explicitly convertible. Uh, like, so if it's implicitly convertible to an encoded value, i.e. it has a conversion operator, then that should work. It's not at the moment, but you get the idea. And then you've got sets. And what I'm also doing is because um, these values could be used in a standard STL container that has hashing, I've also implemented that as well just to make it, you know, it's a naive hash. Um, I might change that to highway hash, um, but it's just there. So any anything that uses my encoded values in, or hashed values or keys in your own apps, you can use them. You don't have to convert to and from all the time. It'll just work. That's nice and uh, straightforward. Now, what does this look like for a developer? Well, if you're storing keys, if we go and have a look in the tests here, if we do um, key value tests, uh, we see here that we've got our values and our keys. So key, simple string, value, some hardly valuable value. Um, <clears throat> I create an encoded value from that and I do set key value. So this is just so it's obvious and explicit so I can compare it later. Normally you just pass in string val and it converts it for you. But this is explicit just because of the test I'm running. What I then do is set the key value and then get this key value back. And what I'm effectively doing is comparing that to that and making sure that they are all the same. So making sure that it's all consistent printing out the values, making sure the type's correct, um, <clears throat> and then making sure uh, that I can set the value, same value again and get a different value back. Uh, sorry, the same value I set the second time back. The reason for that is because originally it was setting, and if it's already set, it was not overwriting the original value, which is a bit dumb. Um, so now we can do buckets as well. So buckets, um, effectively they're just strings at the moment. I'm not sure if there's any need to convert them to anything other than a string. There probably is, but I can't think of one. So at the moment, um, this doesn't support anything other than a string name for a bucket. But I'm open to ideas. If you want to move that, that's fine. And effectively, it's the same set key value with the key and the value, but you also set the bucket. Now under the hood, all well, the indexing is done for you because you've specified the bucket. Like, well, if you specify the bucket, you'll want to retrieve it by bucket later on. You don't have to store things in buckets. Um, the concept of a bucket as a physical piece of storage is not generally a helpful one. Um, it can cause issues depending on how the database works. Personally, I think as far as the developer is concerned, you've got a database, you whack things in it. If you want to segment that up by naming a particular bucket within the same database, you should be allowed to do that. That gives you logical separation and it enables the database to do indexing, it shouldn't be a physical thing. Because if they're physically separate, then you as a developer have to think across all your entire data infrastructure and think, well, that bucket stored over there, this bucket stored over here. All of a sudden, you've got an ETL problem. Really, you want to abstract that away and put that into your database. You shouldn't be doing that external to the database, I think. So the concept of bucket is really like a collection, a named collection. You don't need to. You don't need to use them, in which case it's not indexed, in which case it's slightly faster. But if you do specify buckets, then um, we do do that as well. Um, and then you can get the key via the bucket. That's just to make sure it still works. And then what we do is we support sets. So here we are, simple string. We've got multiple encoded values. So we've got a set of encoded values. And internally, all that is, is a, a unique pointer to an unordered set where the unordered set has an encoded value. The reason I'm using unordered set is because I'm interested in the hashing function. So this is effectively a ground up DB set is really an unordered set of an encoded value. Right. Now adding my encoded values to that. And then set key value, key and set. Because this is a different type, it knows how to handle it. But the get is different. Because this is you telling the database, I know it's a stored as a set go and get me this set and return it as a set, not just as a blob. Um, so it goes off and gets that key. Yeah, and then I'm making sure that all the values are the same um, and that we can definitely find those values and that this size is the correct size. So that's great. We'll then do those query by bucket. So in the memory store, because I always do things by default against the memory store. Um, 
Again, creating a new database, and then I'm creating several key value pairs, so key value, key two, value two, etc. And then the bucket name. So some of them I'm putting in buckets, some of them I'm not. So here we see that value one and value four both in buckets, whereas two and three are not. What I'm then doing is setting up a query just for my bucket name. Yeah. Um, and I'm putting, I'm making sure that that's in a separate string because it, the query will happen later. So I'm just making sure that there's no like memory comparison same. Then what I'm doing is I'm creating a bucket query. So I've created a high-level query interface. You can create your own uh, sub-queries, and all they'll effectively do is um, enable you to kind of uh, test various indexes within the database. They run um, a query uh, exists above the store implementation. So indexing is separate from storage although an index may be stored in a key value store. So at the database level, you can do gets and sets. You can do indexing buckets and those type of things. What the database does is it uses a different store key value store implementation for the underlying functionality. So all of our kind of high level user functionality, such as indexing and things like that, are constructs at the database level. But how that physically happens in the key value store, the key value store should just be a really fast, really specific key value store and have no concept of anything above it. It should just deal with its storage with the keys it's given, not worry about anybody else's keys, and just be true to itself within the, that subset uh, or that shard of the key, right? And that's one, that's one component doing one piece of functionality very, very well. The problem with pushing concepts of indexing all the way down is that all of a sudden everyone's key value store implementation has to implement that functionality. Right, so it's not efficient. So what we want is a really efficient key value store, and then in the indexing, we'll take advantage of how to use the key value store to do efficient things. So that's going to be a higher level, and that's drastically simplified the key value store um, interface. There's no longer the concept of buckets you will not find in the key value store interface. It only exists at the database level. Okay, so that's an important distinction to make. So before it used to look a bit weird that. In the database, you'd have exactly the same function names as in the key value store, whereas now you don't. You've got queries, you've got buckets in the database level, but they do not exist in the key value store. And that's because the key value store should just be a key value store. Um, that's a long winded explanation for something very simple. But effectively, I'm creating my query here uh, and then running that query. So I get a pointer back to a query result. I should probably just call this query result this type, really. Um, and then effectively what I'm doing is I'm pulling back uh, the keys as strings. Now I happen to know that these keys are strings. Um, they could really be any type, um, but I know they're strings. So effectively I'm getting my bytes, which is the key, and then converting that back to a string so I can print it out. Just let's see. Notice that I'm doing uh, this kind of thing. Plus one, adding slash not on the because it's a bar array. And then I'm printing out he is in this bucket, just confirm it. Then it's saying the size is correct, so you pull two back out the four. Key one is in there, key four is in there, but two and three shouldn't be not in the main bucket. Um, and then we're just making sure that the retrieved keys are the same as the saved keys, like the values of the key rather than just the number, um, which is cool. Uh, and then we do the same thing, but against a file store, because we should always do the same test against a different all of our back-end implementation, so we do that as well. That's in there. In addition to that, what else have we done? Yeah, so I found a bug. So my first bug, so obviously you should write a test when you find a bug to make sure you can reproduce it. So this is my load keys into memory store from a file store. So my sets in the file store are fine. My sets um, in the memory store were fine. My sets in a cached um, file store using memory store wrapper were fine. But in the CLI, uh, so in tests, it wouldn't show up because we create a database, do our test, and shut it down. We never create a database, do our work, save it, don't delete it, and then load them again. So this is to catch that problem. Um, so this is basically my file store wasn't loading the keys correctly into the memory store when it was uh, being reloaded from a second start. So on the command line interface, this was showing up. So effectively, I've written a very simple test to duplicate that problem, um, and now I know that you know when that works, um, I know it's fixed, and I keep the test in there because that way I don't have a reversion. Um, 
later on. Uh, what I've also done is put in lots of support for different data types. So in here, uh, I've got a custom type here, which isn't working. Um, and then I've got, because I got fed up of writing this for every single type. So because I'm getting quite into my templating now, I was like, stop that, I'm going to do this. I'm really glad I did, because this is a lot of code um, for something that will be run many, many times. So here we see you know, all these intrinsic types um, are supported in here. So this is to force these types going into here. Um, and then doing the same thing for container types in memory. So doing um, a byte array of bytes, I think bytes. And then doing a list of strings, an array uh, of ints, a DQ of strings, forward lists, lists, sets, maps, multi sets, multi maps, and then unordered associative, so unordered set, which we obviously have I, anyway, unordered map, multi set, and multi map. So all the STL container types, uh, the standard ones you use, do work. The adapters don't, so stack, queue, and priority queue don't work. I'm not sure there's ever a need for them. Um, I hit issues in the templating to detect whether they were containers or not and how to handle them. I'm concentrating more on getting common things up and running at the moment. So I think custom data types is more important than those three containers. So I'm going to make sure that the custom data types are supported first. And then again, doing custom types in memory. This is the thing that isn't working, which is why it's currently hidden. So um, I've hidden that test. It does exist, but it doesn't work. It's low priority item. It wasn't really part of the story. It was more, more out of the box type. So that's all there now. Um, but yeah, really not a huge amount has changed. If you look into the code on the database uh, itself, see not a huge amount of difference. What there is here, so in so this is actually this is an embedded database. I'm going to show you that. So let me show you the header file first. So. I've simplified the key value store implementation. So it's literally set key value, get key value, and the set key value there's two of because some of them are sets. Um the word wrap off a minute. There we go, it's a bit key screwed. Um yeah. So what we've got here um is you can save an encoded value and you can save a set. This is means I don't have to have a different function. Um, or templatized function or anything like that, your key value stores can say very simple. They just use the internal representation encoded value or set. That's all they use. Um, this is so that we can move them. So if it's an encoded value, I do use that value because if it's been constructed in memory, I want to use that. So by the time it hits the key value store, it should have gone over the network and it would be a copy anyway. Or if it's embedded, you shouldn't rely on using that copy because you said go install this which means you don't need an in-memory copy anymore because you've just told us to go and store that. If you want us to put it back, then you need to use an in-value key value store and go and fetch it. So don't ever pass it an encoded value and then try and use that encoded value because we're likely to have stolen the resources from it. Be aware of that. Um, then return the encoded value. This now uses uh, kind of perfect forwarding. So it's really efficient, minimizes the number of copies. I uh, still have the load keys into, which is useful when you've got a wrapping interface, which is quite useful. Um, and useful if you want to also do indexing on load rather than save your indexes, which you might want to do for some constrained environments where you've got lots of memory, not lots of disk, or where you don't want to hack the disk. Um, and again, databases have the same interface here, but with one small difference. And that's that they're these ones here. So can specify a bucket now they're not in key value store so I've taken them out because a key value store like I say shouldn't have the concept of bucket in it's an indexing capability so I've got one key value store for values which is this and then I'm using a separate key value store for indexes the indexes happen to be the values so I've got one key value store for data and one key value store for indexes or, or internal database stuff that's what I want I want the database to handle the logic and the key value stores to be very lean, mean, speed machine. That's what I want. That's what we've done. Uh, oh, I did do query result. I'm glad I did that. Yeah, so I got query result in there. And we can also now, therefore, um, as well as gets and sets, we also got query functions function as well. So I pass a generic query and then a specific 
query uh, overload as well. So I can just, uh, I want to do that this generically eventually. That's all in there. Um, and then implementation wise, they, they just kind of look the same. I mean, the only thing that's um, really changed, not an awful lot, the only thing here is I've got key value store, the internal representation in my memory store. I've got one for the values um, and one for sets. So if they're single values, they're here, and if they're sets, they're here. This is just, just more efficient uh, for me store them like that in memory um, and then I've got a cache store so if, if this is wrapping another store which it might do then I have a pointer to that wrapper so this um, you know, this is the one to cache so this is unique to memory key value store you know having a high speed memory wrapper around something is probably a good idea that's what we do um, and that's now fully implemented yeah so it's really efficient now and um, we also have the of these um these are basically just get store just in memory representations whereas in my file key value store i'm of course going to disk now i've changed the on disk representation so if i have a look in my test folder here and i have a look in ground up uh, default let me make a few If I have a look in here, it's now empty, which of course it would be because <laughs> my tests remove things. Um, so let me uh, just kind of go up here. I'll do my tests and do how to use type. I'll do this and let it insert a whole bunch of stuff before I kill it. Um, so this is doing its setting. Bit a minute. This is default key value store, so this is a cached in memory against disk. So if I do that, that should do it. Um, yeah. So if I go into here, yeah, I've now got a database which is not empty. So this is the values that it was storing. This is why it's so slow. I'm using a different value. So you see, there's an awful lot of these. So it's it's generated thousands of these in a few seconds that I was running that test. So if we actually have a look at this one at the end, uh, let's just grab that so if we do so you remember before i just had like the the kv whereas now i've got a key and a kv for each hash number so this beat previously was that like the string name of the key but of course if you've got weird characters that would blow up on some file systems what i'm doing is i'm hashing the key name and the hash is what the file name becomes because we know that's a number it's easy to convert to a string um so what we're storing in there is we're storing the type um and again the hash value um, and the reason we're storing the type and the hash value is because the same record, uh, multiple records can be hashed to the same amount. So what I'm going to do eventually is in here, have a description of the multiple keys that they relate to. And then in the value, show the value. So this is basically saying um, value has a value. It's of type 3, which is C++ type. So it's not a set, basically. Um, the value is of length 2, so this is a string, basically, uh, of length 2, and the string happens to be a number, but don't get confused. So, in my test, I'm d doing 1 to 100,000, and that's what the values are. So, the value 54 um, is also its its key ID as well, because it's simpler for testing, so that's what 54 hashes to as a string. Um, and obviously, that hash is in here as well. So, the hash is repeated in the file name but also in here. Now, the reason for that is because um, this is the value hash, right? So the same, multiple keys can have values that hash the same value. So this relates to value for that particular um, element. So the same hash KV could have multiple records in, even though it's a single element because multiple things could hash to the same id and that's important that you don't forget um, so that's implemented there but if we have a look in here um there's also an indexes folder um and the indexes uh have not been kept so um i think i'm using my in memory um index store for that particular test so 
the indexes are basically use the same mechanism. The only difference is that you've got um, a set. So if I go, uh, da, 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 da. if I go in here, remember what I'm doing. There we go. Ground up CLI. So if I do um, a set on a database name mydb with key of my key and the value of Adam's value. Um, then uh, actually, yeah, what I can do actually is then do so my key two Adam's value bucketed minus b my bucket. Does that as well. So what I can now do is if I have a look at uh, indexes. We see that we've now got an indexes folder. If I uh, cat indexes, I'll look at the key. So again, the key. This time, the type is set, um, and you'll notice the key. Although I specified it's a bucket of my bucket, because this is an indexes uh, key value store, I'm not just going to have buckets as the indexes. So I'm using this, which is a kind of C++ esque value, and I'm putting that in front of whatever type of index it is. So, uh, an index is effectively a term list, so it's just a list of hashes of keys that match that particular term. So, they're always going to be sets. But this one's for a bucket index of that named bucket. So, there might be multiple for different named buckets. And there'll also be not just buckets, but maybe it's a word search, maybe it's a structure search, if it's JSON. There could be a whole list of different types of indexes, so I've got to prepend it. So that's what the database is doing, it's prepending that string um, on the type of bucket. So if I now oops, if I now have a look at the value, this is where it's diff it will differ. So it's the same at the moment, but if I do, um, I think what's a good example is, um, if, if this was a set, basically, you'd have this repeated. So this has got one, one. So this is, because it's a set, the first number is the number of elements in this set. Um, so this is different from before, whereas you just had this data. And then this is saying that, yes, I have a value. I'm a value one, which is um, a key, because this is an index of keys, basically. The value one's a key. It's of length six. This is the key value, six characters. This is the hash. You'll notice in this instance, the hash of the record is different from the hash of the file it's in. That's because this record is the ID of the record in the parent database. If I grab that and I now cat, what I will have is, I bet you any money, I've got a key in there. There we go. So I've got a key in there with that hash. Yep. So there we go. It's just a key. And then if I do the same on value, that's the value of the thing. So this here is a pointer to this key. And within this key, we can see that it's a, a key with a value. It's a type three, which is C++ or string in this case, 18 characters long, and that's the value. Yeah, and then that's the hash um, of, this, uh, of, of this value. That, that is the hash of the value. Whereas here, the hash of this value uh, is effectively the hash the record so that's how it works that's thinking back so that's basically reverse index and how that works um and i think that's it really that's everything i've got to show you today i mean the performance is pretty amazing um so if we want a quick um oops. what am i doing oh yeah If I do uh, a quick uh, do memory and performance, it should work. There you go. So these are tags that you can use in the catch testing mechanism. So this particular one, in memory key value store performance test for 100 keys. So generating these keys took about a second to do it. It's setting the keys, took 0.25 seconds to do it. 
And now we're running the second test, which is a 1 million key test, because this one was running too quick. And you can see that it generated the keys in 11 seconds, because there's lots of hashing going on. Set the keys in 2.9 seconds and got the keys in 1 second. So this is actually running much quicker than it was. So this is, I've doubled, by doing all the changes over the last few hours, um, making it work on different platforms, uh, this is now running infinitely quicker. Bear in mind, this is debug, right? <laughs> so this is in debug mode. So... In fact, let's check and change that. So in here, we've got CLang work, you know, we've got CMake working in here. So if I go and build um, the non debug version, good. The performance test again. Yeah. There we go. So let's just finish the test. So if we do that, yeah, we see the tests have been updated. So if we can now run the same performance tests again, we should see an order of magnitude difference. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so a little bit of difference there, <laughs> just a little bit. So that doubles the performance. So, but this is a million keys again. So the debug version was setting 340,000 per second and getting 754,000 per second in memory on a million whereas this one is setting 820,000 and getting back 2.42 million so I've now um, basically doubled performance um, by uh, all the recent performance changes I've done on different platforms so that's the end of it really that's the end of everything I've got to show you today hopefully you've enjoyed it um, it's a bit of a whirlwind uh, tour of everything, um, but uh, yeah, hopefully you've found it useful. Um, next, what I'll be doing is I'll be looking at a couple of different things. Not quite sure what to do next. I'm thinking of uh, implementing the kind of Redis wire protocol next, so we can start to run um, the Redis benchmarking tool against this, because uh, I think that will be more useful as a drop-in replacement. Because Redis today is single-threaded anyway from the enterprise version but the open source version single threaded so i'm thinking to implement the redis protocol first and do a compare and contrast just on the functions that we currently support which is obviously less than reddit and then what i'll do is looking potentially at implementing sharding so on one machine still but sharding the database so you'll have a database server that you can install a single instance of on a machine but use all the compute capacity on that machine so unlike redis where you can install on one machine but use the compute capacity for one hardware thread on my big beast here, I'll be able to, you know, do one twenty eighth of the keys. And if I do key sharding very efficiently, I should be able to get around twenty five x or twenty eight x performance improvement um, over this. So rather than set two point four million keys or get two point four million keys a second, it should be around about fifty million. <laughs> so that'll be pretty cool. So um, I'll do the Redis protocol and then I'll do uh, sharding. But hopefully you found that interesting. Uh, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye-bye.